Mrs. Kannan, Associate Professor of Microbiology, Tahoe Medical College and Hospital. Today, I would like to talk about few aspects of COVID-19 diagnosis. The living and working conditions of billions of people worldwide have been significantly disrupted due to different forms of social distancing and lockdowns in many cities. One of the many challenges for containing the spread of COVID-19 is the ability to accurately diagnose both symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. In today's lecture, I'm going to deal with the basic principles of important diagnostic tests. Many diagnostic kits are pipelined for the diagnosis of COVID-19 and hence it is important to understand the basics of various diagnostic tests as it will help us to understand the principle of the kit and also in the research point of view it will help us to develop improvise uh, new diagnostic kits in terms of cost and time. So now let us go into the lecture. The topic of the lecture is COVID-19 diagnostic procedures. For the effective management of COVID-19, there are three key elements. Number one, the timely diagnosis. Number two, effective treatment. And number three, the prevention. Why we need accurate and effective diagnostic test? Number one, to identify the early stage of infection of patients having the symptoms of COVID-19. Okay, the patients may come with different types of symptoms that are related to COVID-19. So it, is, it becomes very, very important for you to identify whether the person is really having COVID-19 or not. So you, your test should be very accurate and effective in that sense. And number two, your test also should have the ability to identify the asymptomatic cases because these asymptomatic cases may likely to spread the virus to their close contacts. Still, uh, we don't know really whether the asymptomatic cases can spread the virus or not, but, but uh, at present scenario, we should be able to uh, diagnose them because they, we have all chances for them to spread the virus to their contacts. So before getting into the uh, diagnostic procedures, uh, let us see first the structure of the virus because basically we should know the structure of the virus. Uh, we should understand the structure of the virus uh, before going into the principles of diagnosis of COVID-19. The COVID-19 is caused by a virus called as SARS coronavirus 2. So this picture shows you the structure of SARS coronavirus 2. Uh, so it is an enveloped virus. You can see the enveloped virus, uh, which is started with, which are started with, which is started with the various proteins. So uh, you have spike protein. You have two types of spike protein, S1 and S2. Then you have nucleocapsid, M, membrane, which is called as M, envelope, which is called as E. And this is a single standard RNA virus, which is positive sense. This virus goes and binds to the receptor of the host cell. The receptor in the host cell, we call it as ACE2 receptor, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor that will be present in the host cell that is in the, in the human being. So this virus goes and binds to it and initiates the pathogenesis. Uh, so uh, at the molecular level, what we should know is that the virus is a single standard positive sense RNA virus and it do have uh, quite a many proteins, some envelope proteins. Uh, so envelope proteins mainly the E and uh, spike and the nucleocapsid protein which is seen in the in the core and uh, the membrane protein which is seen on the envelope. So these are all the important things you should know before going into the diagnosis of the COVID-19. So structure of the SARS coronavirus 2, you should know the important basic proteins uh, and also the genetic constituent of it. There are so many diagnostic tests you would have come across and whatever the diagnostic test may be, it falls under either two categories. One, the molecular assays for the detection of viral nucleic acid and number two, the immunodiagnostic methods. So whatever diagnostic kits we have, either it should fall under molecular assay or it should fall under immunodiagnostic methods. So uh, we shall start with the molecular assay for the detection of viral nucleic acid.
So before uh, discussing about the molecular assays, uh, so let us have a brief look into the central dogma of the molecular biology. So the central dogma states that the DNA is transcribed to RNA and the RNA is translated to protein. So this is what you see in this picture. So the DNA is transcribed to messenger RNA. The process is called as transcription. The RNA is translated to the protein. We call this process as translation. So this is what happens in the central dogma. The transcription of DNA, I mean the RNA from the DNA, we call uh, it as, as transcription and the enzyme that is involved is called as transcriptase. Similarly, the RNA uh, is translated to protein by, uh, by a, a lengthy phenomenon, uh, both in eukaryote and prokaryote, we have different mechanisms. But what we are going to look into is this transcription process. As I told, the transcription is done by an enzyme called transcriptase. The other name of the transcriptase enzyme is RNA polymerase. So you know, the RNA is uh, created from the DNA. Uh, so the enzyme obviously involved is the RNA polymerase. This RNA polymerase is dependent on this DNA molecule. So we call the enzyme as DNA dependent RNA polymerase. Similarly, the RNA can be reverse transcripted to the DNA. So we call this process as reverse transcription. So obviously the enzyme you can name as reverse transcriptase. So the enzyme involved in reverse transcription is nothing but the reverse transcriptase. But the name of this enzyme is the DNA polymerase that is dependent on the RNA. So the reverse transcriptase is done by an enzyme called reverse transcriptase otherwise the DNA polymerase or the RNA dependent DNA polymerase. So to sum up uh, the DNA can be transcribed to RNA and RNA can be reverse transcribed to the DNA and the enzyme involved is transcriptase for the DNA to RNA and RNA to DNA we have reverse transcriptase the process of, is called as reverse transcription. So this is what happens uh, uh, in the regular uh, cell uh, multiplication or uh, metabolism. Okay, so when uh, exactly the molecular diagnostic techniques started? It all started when the entire sequence of the SARS coronavirus 2 was uploaded on January 10, 2020 to this GZ website. This GZ website is nothing but the global initiative on sharing all influenza data. So even if you open this website, you can find a lot of uh, databases regarding the uh, genome of the SARS coronavirus 2. So once the sequence, the entire sequence was submitted to the common website, the various researchers, the companies, pharmaceutical companies, diagnostic companies, all these people could able to bring out various kits based on the molecular biology. So on whole you can see there are basically three important molecular techniques available for diagnosis of COVID-19. The one uh, which is on the top is the reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction shortly called as RT-PCR. So RT-PCR is the familiar and uh, most important test that is conducted for the diagnosis of COVID-19. And the other two tests are isothermal nucleic acid amplification. The third one, the nucleic acid hybridization using microarray. But this is not very popular. And the reverse transcriptase, uh, uh, transcription PCR or reverse transcriptase PCR is the popular technique used uh, under the molecular technique. Okay, so let us see something about the reverse transcription PCR. So this reverse transcription PCR, what it does, it just amplifies a tiny amount of viral genetic material in a given sample. And very importantly, for the diagnosis of COVID-19, is considered to be the gold standard. So before 
going into the reverse transcription PCR, let us begin with the basics of the polymerase chain reaction. Then only we can understand what is a reverse transcription PCR and what is a real time reverse transcription PCR, etc. And uh, we, we need a strong foundation basics about the polymerase chain reaction. The knowledge of polymerase chain reaction is very, very important before performing such assay because each and every kit they will have a different type of components and a, a person who is involved in the diagnosis should able to understand what are all these components and how to really utilize it. So the basis of the polymerase chain reaction is very, very important for the people who are involved in the diagnosis of COVID-19. So what is a polymerase chain reaction? So it is a technique used to make numerous copies of specific segment of the DNA. I'll repeat specific segment of the DNA quickly and accurately. So you are not going to amplify the entire sequence given sequence. You are going to amplify only a specific segment or a region of DNA that too accurately. So this is the main uh, important uh, aspect of the polymerase chain reaction and another important thing what should what you should know is this reaction is performed by an instrument called thermocycler so all polymerase chain reactions you need that instrument called thermocycler so what is a thermocycler what uh, it does for the performation of or conduction of this uh, polymerase chain reaction. So the thermocycler simply raises and lowers the temperature uh, of the samples that are uh, holding in the block. So this is the block on the top. You can see the block. The samples will be loaded here. Uh, these samples will be subjected with the different temperatures. So this PCR machine or the thermocycler uh, could able to uh, subject the samples to different temperatures. So the key feature of this instrument is that it can change to any temperature in a fraction of a second. So that is, a, that is what is very important. The name thermocycler itself will give you what the machine does. So it cycles different temperatures for different type of time that we have programmed. So this instrument basically have the programming feature by which you can program the, the temperature, the time uh, and the cycles, the number of cycles, etc. So with with this instrument only, you can perform the PCR reactions. So whenever you want to perform PCR reactions, the main requirement for your lab is to procure this thermocycler. Okay, so let us go into the principle and uh, the steps uh, that is involved in the polymerase chain reaction. So this picture shows you the, the DNA replication that happens in a cell. So here you can see, uh, interesting thing, uh, it needs two important components. One is RNA primer, the another one is the DNA polymerase enzyme. Okay, so in this picture you can see uh, in this portion, the RNA primer. Uh, what uh, the DNA polymerase enzyme can do is that it can add, it can add the, nu the, the nucleic acids to the already uh, present nucleotide. It cannot just start up the synthesis of DNA. It cannot start the synthesis of DNA, the polymerase enzyme. It needs a small sequence, what we call it as RNA primer. From there only it can slowly add on the, the nucleotide, the nitrogenous basis to the growing chain. So this is what the polymerase enzyme does. So this is, this is what happens in the uh, normal replication, DNA replication process in our cell. So this phenomenon only we are going to exploit for our the polymerase chain reaction. So we are going to uh, prepare a primer, artificial primer. So in, in natural DNA replication, the RNA is being utilized as the primer. But in PCR, we are going to use a primer and then we are going to subject it with the polymerase enzyme. And the polymerase enzyme will, will start to add the nitrogenous bases and grows the nucleotide chain. Okay, so this is the basic steps that is involved in the polymerase chain reaction. So we let us start with the step one. It goes in the clockwise direction. The step one, we call it as denaturation. The temperature normally we use is 
95 degree Celsius. So what is denaturation of DNA? The denaturation of DNA is nothing but the conversion of the double standard RNA into single standard RNA. So the R double standard RNA will be separated as single standard RNA. This phenomenon we call it as denaturation. But the denaturation can be done with the help of increase in temperature. Okay. So the temperature at which the DNA separates into two single strands is called as melting temperature. Okay. So the melting temperature differs from different DNA and it all depends on the GC content. More the GC content, more will be the uh, melting temperature. So initially you denature. So we keep 95 degrees Celsius well above the uh, melting temperature. Then the step two, what we call it as annealing. A very important step. The temperature here I have given 55 degrees Celsius, but it may differ uh, something between 50 to uh, 60 degrees Celsius. It all depends what type of primer you use. So in this step, what you do, the primer is, uh, uh, is added and it, it, it will go and bind to a specific region. You'll have two primers, forward and reverse primer. So here you can see the forward primer. Here you can see the reverse primer goes and attaches because they are because of the complementary in nature. They goes and attaches to the two strands of the DNA. And this happens in a particular temperature annealing temperature and then the step three we call it as the extension of synthesizing so in this step the temperature uh, normally we keep it 72 degree celsius i'll tell you why and in this step what happens the dna polymerase enzyme will start to add the uh, nitrogenous bases and the chain will start to elongate and the single standard DNA will now become a double standard DNA. So on the top, you can see a, a double standard DNA has now get, got converted into two double standard DNA. So this is one cycle and this cycle will constantly go on and the uh, DNA will start to amplify or it will make uh, multiple copies of a specific portion where the primer binds only that portion will be uh, amplified or multiplied and uh, this is what happens in a conventional RNA in all the PCR. Okay, um, so to perform the PCR, what are all the things you require? You require uh, mainly uh, four important things. So number one, the primer, uh, number two, the tag polymerase and enzyme, the DNA polymerase. Uh, number three, the DNTPs, and number four, the magnesium ion and the buffer. So, what is a primer? Primer is a synthetic oligonucleotide, and this is complement to a specific region of target DNA. And this primer length is normally in between 18 to 22 base pairs, and the melting temperature should be within 52 to 58 degrees Celsius. So very, very important. The, the TM of the primer should be within this limit. And also the length. The length is very important. It should be neither small nor very big. Uh, so we have to see to that the primer length is within this range. And we'll use a set of primer. One is called as forward primer. Another one is called reverse primer. Both the sequence will be different and they'll be complementary to a particular region of the two of the DNA. So tag polymerase, so what is its role? It synthesizes the DNA in the PCR process. To synthesize, it needs a primer, that's what I told. Uh, what it all does, it adds the nucleotide in a direction of 5 prime to 3 prime, it adds. So it cannot start the, uh, start the synthesis of nucleotide sequence it can add uh, it can all what it can do is it can add only the nucleotide to a direction of 5 prime to 3 prime wherever the primer is present so if the primer is present from the primer it will start to add the nucleotide and this happens in the direction of 5 prime to 3 prime and the dna polymerase what we use in this pcr should tolerate the extreme heat that is subjected because you know uh, the first step especially the denaturation step, we keep 92 degrees Celsius for the DNA polymerase. 
or the tag polymerase enzyme could able to tolerate such high temperature. Uh, so we are using this specific tag polymerase enzyme. This enzyme was derived from a bacteria called Thermus aquaticus. That's the name uh, tag polymerase. And this is a very special enzyme that can resist extremely high temperature, but its optimal temperature is 72. That's the reason why the third step, the extension or synthesizing step, uh, we keep the temperature or we set the temperature at 72 degree Celsius. The another important component is the DNTPs. The DNTPs contributes or it's a raw material for the nucleotide sequence. So the DNTP is, uh, con is consists of four uh, basic nucleotides. So the, the adenosine triphosphate, deoxyadenosine triphosphate, deoxy the cytosine triphosphate, deoxyguanosine triphosphate, and the TT, deoxy TTP. So all these things, uh, the four important nitrogenous bases in the form of DNTPs should be added to the PCR reaction. And these are the building blocks of the new DNA strands. So without this, uh, the, the, the polymerase enzyme cannot uh, elongate the nucleotide sequence. And importantly, all these four nitrogenous bases or uh, the DNTPs should be added in EQ molar amounts. The last uh, requirements, but not least, because they are also very important, uh, the magnesium ions, they function as a cofactor for the activity of DNA polymerases. So the magnesium ion, without this magnesium ion, the polymerase enzyme cannot function at all. Not only this enzyme, many enzymes like exonuclease and uh, RNA polymerase enzymes, all these enzymes require the magnesium ions. Without this, uh, the polymerase enzyme or exonuclease uh, enzymes cannot function at all. So it's very important to supply the magnesium ions to the PCR uh, reaction mixture. And also you need the buffer to maintain the, the pH uh, and uh, the other things, uh, the, the environment that is required for the activity of the DNA polymerase because the enzyme requires uh, the appropriate pH. So it's very important to have a buffer. Okay, so so far we saw the basic uh, important uh, uh, requirements for the PCR. Also, we saw the basic principle behind the PCR. Now, let us come to the so-called real-time PCR. So, the real-time PCR, uh, we call it all, also as a RPCR, or uh, quantitative PCR, shortly QPCR. So, here, what is the difference between the conventional PCR and the real-time PCR is the, in the sense, the, the amount of nucleic acid present in the sample can be quantified. And also, uh, you can able to see the amplification in real time. That's the reason why we call it as a real time PCR. In the real time, you can see the multiplication or the amplification of the DNA. The another thing is multiplexing. So what is multiplexing? At a time, you can amplify multiple target DNAs. So that is another uh, important feature of real time PCR. So multiplexing, suppose I amplify two, two gene or two target DNA, we call it as a duplexing or triplexing in case of three, pentaplexing in case of five, okay. So, uh, to do a quantification or to see the amplification in real time, we do some, uh, uh, we have some identification techniques. So, based on that, the real time PCR can be of two types. Number one, the intercalating dye based method and number two, the hydrolysis probe based method. So, intercalating dye based method and hydrolysis probe based method. So let us see what is the intercalating dye based method. And most of the uh, time the real time PCR for the beginners, it's always wise enough to start with this technique. Uh, you will have the dye which can give its own fluorescence. Okay, the dye, the fluorescent dye which can emit fluorescence. So that's what uh, we will use it in this intercalating dye based method. Once the dye binds to the double standard DNA, uh, the fluorescence will emit. So this is an intercalating dye. What the dye actually do, does is, this will go and intercalate the double standard DNA. When it intercalates, its structure differ, differs. When the structure differs, its fluorescence emission is also multiplied. It 
goes 100 to 1000 fold multiply, uh, multiplication of its fluorescence. So that's what happens when it intercalates. Okay. So whenever the dye goes and binds or intercalates to the double standard DNA, the, the fluorescence increases. So now what really happens when the amplification process starts? The more and more number of double standard DNA are synthesized and more and more number of the dye goes and intercalates and the fluorescence will start to increase. Okay. So you will have a baseline fluorescence the, the beginning of the uh, the, the RT-PCR and real-time PCR. Uh, you will have a baseline uh, baseline fluorescence. So we will have the baseline fluorescence. From that you will see the increase of the fluorescence. So this is what uh, are done in the intercalating dye based method. So it is very simple. You will have a dye that can intercalate to the double standard DNA thereby it can increase the fluorescence. So commonly used uh, dye is uh, SYBR green the popularly used dye. Uh, many PCR which has the intercalating dye based method are using this dye. So what is the advantage of this intercalating dye based method? The method is a rapid, quick, reliable and cost effective. On the other hand, the disadvantage is that this DNA binding dye can bind to any double standard DNA. So even it can bind to a non-specific sequence and it can produce the fluorescent signals. So uh, the specificity of the test is entirely relies on the primer. If the primer is not going to be specific, then definitely you are going to get a, a non-specific fluorescent signal. So this is the disadvantage or a main disadvantage of this intercalating dye based method. So to overcome this, what they do uh, instead of three steps, they convert the PCR into two steps. Then in the sense they will have denaturation at 92 degrees Celsius. Followed by that, they will keep the temperature of around 60 degrees Celsius to perform both the uh, annealing as well as the extension. So you know very well uh, the polymerase enzyme needs 72 degrees Celsius for its optimal temperature, I mean optimal temperature condition to perform its activity. So when you keep at 60, to 60 degrees Celsius, so the activity may not be that good. So that is that way it, it gives the disadvantage for this technique. The second and the popular method that is utilized in COVID-19 diagnostic kit is the probe based detection method. You have two types of probes. Uh, so your kit, the COVID-19 kit, whatever you buy or you get for your lab uh, may use even uh, any one of these probes. So you should be able to identify uh, or you should be able to know uh, about these two types of probes. So one is the linear probe, the another one is the molecular weekends. So these two probes may any one may be used in your COVID-19 diagnostic kit. So let us see what it is. The line, linear probes are the short single standard sequence, short single standard sequence specific DNA molecule. Specific in the sense it can go and bind only to a specific region of the DNA. And this probe is labeled with a fluorescent dye. We call it as a reporter molecule and this is attached to the three prime end of the probe. Three prime end of the probe and the five prime end is attached with a quincher dye. Attached with a quincher dye. What this quincher dye will do? It can able to quench the fluorescent signal of the reporter dye when they are in the close proximity. So in a probe, it is in the close proximity. One side you have the quincher and the other side you have the reporter and they are in the close proximity. So a probe, a linear probe will not emit fluorescent signal at all because of the presence of the quincher dye. Right? So this is what uh, about the linear probe and this is this linear probe is used for the performation of the real-time PCR. So how the real uh, linear probes work? So let us see how it works. So the tag polymerase, the tag polymerase enzyme that is used in the real-time PCR also have another activity that is it has a exonuclease activity. It can grow the chain from 5 prime to 3 prime and also when it comes up come across any strand 
obstructing its, uh, its activity, it can able to uh, cleave those nucleotide bases. So this is what we call it as exonuclease activity. So it can just cut the nitrogenous bases one by one at the direction of five prime to three prime. So this is what the polymerase enzyme does. So this activity of the polymerase enzyme is being exploited in the linear probe method. So what it does, uh, the, the polymerase enzyme starts to uh, add the nitrogenous bases. This probe will be attached or bound to the uh, DNA sequence uh, in somewhere in the middle of the DNA sequence. So once the polymerase uh, enzyme reaches that place, it breaks the probe. It breaks the probe during the process of extending the DNA. Okay. So once the probe is dissociated, the reporter and pincher are separated. The reporter and pincher are separated. The reporter molecules uh, will unquench so that unquenched so that it will release the fluorescence okay so this is what happens so the the uh, reporter molecules will be uh, emitting the fluorescence uh, because of the absence of this quincher So this picture uh, shows you the uh, the linear probe method of real time PCR. You can see the, the the primer at this prime prime end that grows from pi prime to three prime, uh, and in between you can see the probe, the probe having the quincher and also the reporter die. So what happens once the DNA grows forward? The DNA polymerase will dissociate or First, initially displace and it will dissociate them, thereby releasing the reporter dye from the top quincher. So this reporter dye will now exhibit the fluorescence. So more, uh, more and more amplification process occurs. More and more reporter molecules will be released from the quincher, thereby emitting fluorescence. So at the real time, the the increase in fluorescence can be recorded, and this will tell you the amount of amplified DNA. The probe based method has its own advantage and disadvantage. The advantage you can multiplex it in the sense uh, the multiple probes are available for multiple template. So you can uh, do a multiplexing uh, probably two, three or even four, five. Uh, so, so many target DNAs can be amplified at a time. So that's what I said multiplexing it is available because for all these different type of DNA targets, you can use different types, I mean, different colored fluorescent molecules. So uh, right now uh, for COVID-19, uh, they are multiplexing uh, with a few of the target uh, genes. So most of the COVID-19 kits are multiplex kits. So you should know what is a multiplex kit. And most of the COVID-19 kits are using this linear probe method. But what is the disadvantage is that uh, the, the annealing temperature so we, you, we actually set the annealing temperature based on the primer, but the probe is again a small nucleotide sequence entirely different from the primer. So the annealing temperature of the probe as well as the primer, both may differ. And if they differ uh, very much, then it's going to be a problem. So we have to see to that the primer and probe, they have a closely uh, matching with the, uh, with the annealing temperature. So say for example, you keep the annealing temperature of 60, it would able to say the primer uh, should have annealing temperature of something around 50 or 58 or 59, or the probe, it should have uh, around uh, again 58 or 59 or 60 or something like that. So we have to set, uh, see to that, uh, to, to have a annealing temperature, which is closely matches both the primer and probe. But most of the times, the troubleshooting comes because of this. So next one, what we are going to see is uh, molecular beacons. 
So the molecular beacons are single standard hairpin shaped oligonucleotide probes. So that's what you are seeing in this picture. It's uh, it almost looks like a hairpin shaped. The oligonucleotide made up of oligonucleotide. It's again a probe, but it's not it is not a linear probe. It's a hairpin shaped probe. And in presence of the target sequence, so imagine it goes and binds to the target sequence. This molecular beacons will unfold and it will emit the fluorescence. So this hairpin shaped molecular beacons consist of four parts. The loop, the loop is made up of 18 to 30 base pair and this is this will be the complementary sequence to the target sequence of the DNA. Okay. So the loop, the, the base pair, base that are present on the loop should be complementary to the target sequence. It's the one which goes and binds to the target DNA. It has a stem. It has a stem and the B kind stem sequence lies on the both the ends of the loop. It is typically 5 to 7 base pair long and both the ends are complementary to each other. That's the reason why it could able to form a R pin pin bend okay so it's a complement so they attach each other forming a hair pin bend okay but the third and fourth one are very very important uh, at the five prime end you have a fluoropore uh, the reporter dye and the three prime end you have the quincher so the quincher and uh, the reporter dye the, the fluoropore both are uh, like both are lying in the close proximity as i told the molecular becomes when it binds to the target sequence it becomes a linear molecule thereby separating the quincher and the reported dye far apart so that the reported dye could emit the fluorescence okay so let us see in detail how the molecular becomes works when the two ends of the hairpin stem are close or in close proximity with each other the reported molecule is quenched by the quincher that is present on the other side and it cannot generate the fluorescence. But when it binds to the complementary sequence, the two ends of the air pin will get separated with each other so that the quincher is now blocked and the reporter dye will be released and it will emit the fluorescence. Okay, so this picture will tell you uh, how really this uh, molecular beacons work. So here, this is the molecular beacon having a quincher and reporter uh, in the close proximity. But once it binds to the target DNA, uh, it is uh, it becomes almost linear. Uh, the reporter and quincher now separated wide apart. So the reporter molecule now emits the fluorescence. So every time when the molecular becomes binds to the target DNA, so you know the target DNA is going to multiply in each and every step. So each, in each and every step, uh, the, the molecular beacons are going to bind more and more and it will emit the fluorescence accordingly. So uh, this fluorescence now can be uh, recorded and this will give in real time the amplification process. So what is the uh, key features of this molecular beacons? The molecular beacon probes are highly sequence specific and are best choice for the sensitive reactions. If the probe cannot find its complementary sequence, it remains in hairpin loop and it prevents the non-specific binding. The probe chemistry doesn't rely on the DNA polymerase activity. You, you saw in the linear probe method, uh, the linear probe purely depends on the activity of the DNA polymerase. So the exonuclease activity of the DNA polymerase is very, very important. So it is depend on the DNA polymerase activity. But in, in case of molecular B kinds, uh, it, it's not, dependent on this DNA polymerase. It is independent of the DNA polymerase. All it does is it goes and binds to a specific region of the amplified DNA and it becomes unfolds. So, so it is totally not relying on the DNA polymerase activity. And so you, it's very comfortable to perform the uh, PCR reaction in three steps with the three different temperatures. So you can keep the 72 degrees Celsius uh, uh, for the uh, extension step thereby uh, you can keep the polymerase enzymes activity to the optimum. Okay, so having seen the basics of the 
uh, reverse transcription PCR. Uh, let us see now uh, the reverse transcription PCR uh, for the COVID-19. Uh, the key feature, it is the gold standard for the identification of the SARS coronavirus 2 virus that causes COVID-19. And uh, the good news, many commercial kits are approved by ICMR and, and are used now by many labs. The real-time reverse transcriptase or reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, this, that's what we have to call uh, about the technique that is now used for the diagnosis of COVID-19 shortly called as R RT PCR stands for real time reverse transcript uh, transcription polymerase chain reaction the target uh, genes that are used by many kits so one is uh, uh, the open reading frame 1b and uh, 8 then the nucleocapsidin and spike protein are also used uh, dna dependent dna polymerase is a viral uh, enzyme that is present in the uh, SARS coronavirus 2. This is also used shortly called as RDRP. The envelope E genes are also used by many kids. Uh, if you take the uh, the RRT PCR kids, either that may be a one step RT PCR or two step RT PCR. In one step RT PCR, uh, it uses a single tube containing the necessary primers to run the entire RT-PCR reaction. Okay, so uh, the single tube will contain right from the beginning. So the RNA of the virus will be converted into the DNA and this will further continue into the uh, amplification process. So that was that, that's what happens in the one step RT-PCR. In two step RT-PCR, uh, the reverse transcription, uh, transcription process will be uh, taken in one tube. So what they do, they put the RNA and uh, uh, convert the RNA into the DNA uh, by uh, the enzyme reverse transcriptase. And then uh, the DNA that is that has been converted will be uh, will be again put into another tube, and the PCR reaction will be carried out. This is the two-step RT-PCR. So both uh, can be done but most of the kids employ this one step procedure generally preferred approach for the direction because it's quick to set up just but in one tube you will add the template and you will complete the entire reaction so it's quick to set up uh, it involves a limited sample handling and a reduced bench time uh, further there is a decreasing chances for pipetting errors cross contamination between the RT and real PCR steps. So what do they mean is that uh, in one tube you will perform the reverse transcription and you will transfer the uh, material to the another, another, another tube. Uh, so sometimes you may likely to com commit some pipetting errors or uh, there may be some cross contamination of some other DNA molecules. So you may get some other false reactions. So those things can be avoided in one step procedure. But uh, why they go for two step procedure because if they want to have the DNA for the future use. Uh, so I will do a two step procedure. So I will do a transcription from there. I will take a small portion of the DNA and the remaining portion of the DNA. I can preserve it and you can use it again in future for any other use. So that's the advantage of two step procedure. Otherwise you can go for a one step procedure as it involves a lot of uh, advantages. Okay, so this picture uh, gives you exactly what happens. So, as you all know, the virus is a RNA virus, single standard RNA virus. So, it has to be trans I mean, reverse transcribed uh, into the DNA. So, this uh, DNA, so it will form a single standard DNA. We call it as a complementary DNA or cDNA. Okay, so this cDNA so is converted from the RNA with the help of reverse transcriptase enzyme. And uh, then this DNA uh, will start to, when the primer will bind and it will make them as a double strand, uh, double standard DNA and then uh, it will start the, the PCR process, the step one, I mean the cycle one, cycle two will start and the DNA will start to multiply. So this is what happens in the reverse transcription PCR. So the initial step is the conversion of the viral RNA into complementary DNA or cDNA that is again a single strand. The primer will convert it into double strand and then this double strand 
to again put it to the, the cycle of PCR and it will start to amplify it. Okay. So uh, now we have, as I told, a uh, lot of kits uh, had now come, uh, come into the market and so many kits are being uh, released in various countries. And uh, there are so many websites, for, say for example, this website, website updates uh, each and every day, what are the different kits are available under different uh, headings, say molecular uh, uh, analysis kits, the immunodiagnostic kits. All these lists are being put in different uh, types of websites. You can just go in and see uh, what are the kits are available with us uh, in the different parts of the world or different parts of the country. Okay, uh, I want to give uh, at least one example uh, of uh, how a kit, a real-time RT-PCR kit will look uh, like. Uh, so this is the kit uh, that has been uh, called as RLTIS, a real-time RT-PCR kit uh, used by many in the in, in India. So let us see what actually the kit has. So this is the the, the one uh, you can see the the, the the kit details. So they are given uh, what are the samples that can be used and uh, the, the details of the kit, how many tests you can do, uh, etc. And this uh, part shows the kit component. So that's what I said, uh, we should be uh, quite familiar with the, the PCR process. What are all the requirements? So what are all the things should be done in the PCR? Uh, so here you can see the mass mix. So normally uh, in a conventional PCR, those days we used to prepare the master mix. We add the DNTPs, TAC polymerase, magnesium and buffers, etc. But now everything is pre-prepared and uh, being uh, being uh, available in the form of so-called master mix, ready-made master mix. And uh, you also have the probe mix, so very important. And uh, this probe mix will contain both the primer and the probes and uh, you have the positive and negative control. The positive control will be normally the gene for which you are going to do the RT-PCR. And this is not essentially a virus, only the gene along with a plasmid will be present as the positive control, a non-infectious in nature. So you need to worry about, the, about using the positive control. So here at the bottom, you can see um, uh, what are all the genes. So it is a multiplexing, so you can see three gene can be detected, RDRP, E and N genes can be detected. So it's a triplex uh, kit uh, that can be uh, detecting simultaneously these three genes. So all these uh, details should be seen when you go for a, for a kit. All these details you have to see. Okay, so mm, uh, here you can see in India, as far as the India is concerned, the ICMR uh, updates periodically uh, about the kits, what are the kits and uh, uh, what are the types of uh, gene that you have to detect, all those things. So here you can see the suspected human sample should be first tested for E gene assay and then the confirmatory assay should be done uh, by detecting the RDRP and N gene assay. So this is what given by the ICMR. Uh, so in India, we follow this. So initially, we can put a monoplex uh, real-time PCR detecting only the E gene. If it is E gene negative, we will take it as COVID-19 negative. If E gene positive, then we have to go for further testing of this RDRP and NGNSA. This is this is what uh, uh, given by ICMR. So this may be changing time to time. So every time uh, when it changes, you have to go go accordingly uh, so we have to strictly follow the icmr guidelines uh, okay so coming to the other molecular methods because uh, this real time pcr uh, needs a lot of instrumentation uh, technical staffs etc the people had come out with some simple uh, molecular based assay so this is what uh, uh, now you are seeing in the slide uh, you, you put it together as isothermal nucleic acid amplification. It says that one temperature or a single temperature is enough to perform the molecular uh, type of diagnosis because you know 
uh, you know, perform a test in different temperatures, like in a conventional PCR, you need the thermocycler. So this avoids uh, the thermocycler or any other costly related instruments. Uh, so these techniques are also available. And when you go uh, into the uh, different types of kits, few kits are based on these type of uh, techniques. Even in India, certain indigenous kits are being developed by different uh, people. Okay, so that's what regarding the molecular diagnosis. Uh, now coming to the second type of diagnostic test that is the serological or immunological assays. So strictly I won't say that they are all diagnostic kits. So these are the kits that detects the immunoglobulin M and immunoglobulin G antibodies in the COVID-19 patient. But as on now, these kits are not used for diagnostic purpose. Okay. So the ICMR, even the WHO was, was not recommending this kit as the diagnostic kit. So what uh, the use of what, what is the use of these kits then? So it plays an important role in the epidemiology and vaccine development. So these kits are very, very important to play a role in epidemiology and vaccine development, I'll tell you how. Uh, so before that, uh, you should understand uh, the immunology behind the, uh, the infection, any infection. The IgM becomes the first detectable antibody in the serum. So even in the COVID-19, this is the scenario, uh, the IgM first becomes detectable in the serum after a few days. And after a couple of weeks up, uh, upon infection, uh, the IgM will be switched to IgG. Okay, so the detection of IgM will tell that the patient is suffering from the uh, infection with not the early stage of infection. And if IgG is detected alone, and then we can tell that the patient is now uh, in the later stage of infection. And also IgG may suggest the present of post-infection immunity. In the sense, if, if suppose I detect IgG after six months or one year of the infection, it means that uh, the person has conferred with the post-infection immunity. So this is where the vaccine development, uh, it helps with the vaccine development. Suppose I could able to detect IgG after two years, three years. It means uh, the vaccines are, uh, the development of vaccines are fruitful. You can give the vaccines to the patient, thereby you can prevent the, uh, prevent the infection of COVID. So that's what uh, uh, it means, okay? So uh, these serological and immunological assays so far is, only uh, been recommended for the seroprevalence study or to do a, a research study uh, to see how the, the antibodies are being developed and sustained after the post-infection in the patients. Okay, uh, its implication, as I told, it has a huge potential for the epidemiological studies of COVID-19. But it has a lot of uh, pitfalls. Uh, that's the reason why the, the ICMR or WHO, uh, they are not recommending this kit for the uh, diagnosis. Because uh, sometimes it, give, it may give a, a zero positive. Sometimes it may give zero negative. And it has a, it has a high limitations with that of sensitivity and specificity. And each kit differs uh, in the sensitivity and specificity. So, uh, at present, this uh, serological or immunological assays uh, cannot be taken as a diagnostic test. Okay, now uh, let us see uh, the basic principle involved in the uh, serological or the immunological kits. So this is the principle of ELISA kits uh, to detect the antibodies and antigens in the patient serum. So on the left side, you can see the detection of the antibodies in the patient serum. So the viral antigen, the SARS coronavirus 2 antigens are coated in the microwell plate. Then the patient's serum is added. The antibodies in the patient's serum binds to this antigen. And this enzyme labeled antibodies, this, uh, uh, when it is added, will bind to the primary antibody. Okay. Then uh, when you add the substrate, it will produce the color. So simply it is the principle of indirect ELISA. And if you want to detect the antigen uh, in the patient serum, just you have to put patient serum or saliva or any body fluids, it doesn't matter. 
So you have to coat the antibody in the micro well plate. Then you have to add the patient serum containing the viral antigen. So it will bind. Then you will add the enzyme labeled specific antibodies. So it is a sandwich or direct ELISA. The principle of sandwich or direct ELISA is involved in this uh, technique. Okay. So now comes an interesting slide. Uh, many times you would have heard about the so-called rabbit kits uh, in the news, in the in the many websites, uh, even some controversial uh, issues regarding this uh, rabbit diagnostic test. So what it is? So it, it is nothing but the lateral flow immunase. Uh, why it is called rabbit kit? Because you can see the result within 10 minutes. Even 10 minutes, within 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you can just see the results. And uh, very important feature is uh, uh, it never uh, I mean uh, it, it never needs any trained personnel at all. It's inexpensive. The test is inexpensive. Requires no trained personnel. Okay. So what it is? It's a qualitative uh, chromatographic assay that is small, portable, and used at the point of care. Even in the, at the bedside, I can just take a fingerprint blood and I can do the test and I can tell the results within 10 to 30 minutes. So it's a bedside, bedside test, very easy to perform. And uh, it is, as I told, it is inexpensive and requires no trained personnel. So here I'll show you the principle in this picture. So here is the place where you uh, put the serum or blood of the patient. Uh, so because of the later, lateral capillary flow, this antibodies present in the patient serum will move. And here you can see uh, this region, you have the SARS coronavirus antigen, which is labeled, okay, which is labeled that will go and bind to the patient's serum. It will go and bind to the patient's serum. Here, uh, interestingly, you can see the control antibody. Along with this, you can see the control antibody. And this is uh, used to validate the assay. So once the serum moves along, this will the antibodies will bind here and both this will move and what happens the antigen antibody complex the antigen antibody complex uh, will get trapped by the secondary antibody here okay the secondary antibody here the antigen antibody complex formed because of the antibody present in the patient serum will be trapped here because of the immobilized secondary antibody and this control, the control moves further and here it has the antibody that captures this control complex, I mean the control antibodies. It will be captured by this anti-antibody here. So this will be the control and this will be the test. Okay. So a color will be developed when it forms a complex, a color will be developed. So this is what the result you will see. Uh, the first one shows only the control, the control shows the line, it means that the test is working. And this, uh, this rapid test can able to detect both the IgG and IgM separately. So there is no colored line in the G and M, so no antibodies, so uh, there is no antibodies in the patient serum for the, uh, the, the SARS coronavirus 2. Here you can see the line is there in the G. It means the IgG is present against the virus. Here you can see M is present. Uh, the IgG is absent. IgM is present. So uh, you can you can just conclude that the patient is in the early stage of infection. Here the both the antibodies are present. So G IgG as well as IgM is present. Okay. So you can see the the sample is loaded here and it moves because of capillary action. So very simple test can be performed within few minutes. Apart from antibody, even a uh, lot of antigen detecting, rapid antigen detecting test kits are available based on many such principles. That is also now uh, many kits have come. Okay, to conclude, uh, still uh, we need need in a lot of accurate and rapid diagnostic kits for the detection of the SARS COVID virus 2 infection. At present, the RT-PCR remains as the gold standard in the diagnosis of COVID-19 and 
uh, many uh, improvisations are made uh, in this uh, technique and new new kits are now being available and icmr are periodically updating such kits validating and updating the kits that can be used for the diagnosis of covid 19 okay um uh, one, one more important thing what i want to share with you is so this is the icmr website so where to go and see the updates so when you open the icmr website here you can see the testing strategy so just you can click the testing strategy you can find uh, the the different uh, updated informations so you can just download this files and you can just check what the icmr has recommended so they have given a lot of uh, updates on molecular based test and also the the rapid antigen test also being given and uh, they are given uh, antigen detection test antibody rapid test all these things have been updated periodically and you can download and you can just check uh, what you should do exactly at this particular point of time so you have to always have touch with this icmr website and uh, And so this is one uh, which, uh, which I downloaded from ICMR. Uh, so here you can see they have given a list of kits, various kits that has been approved by the ICMR as on 17th uh, June 2020. Uh, so a, a very big list has been given by ICMR. And interestingly, you can see uh, some indigenous kits are also present. So very happy to see various Indian, Indian made kits are now available. Uh, apart from the imported kits, you can see as many as uh, 100 and, uh, 110 uh, approved kits under the molecular methods. Similarly, you can also find uh, approved testing kits, immunoassay kits or serological kits uh, that can also be uh, updated, that are also been updated. But they have very clearly given in ICMR website that these kits cannot be used for diagnostic purpose and has been strongly recommended for the zero prevalence study that is the epidemiological studies you can use it and also for the research purpose say for example you are under the preparation of vaccine uh, so the efficacy of the vaccine depends on the the post infection immunity so the now these kits are being used the serological kits are being used to study the post infection immunity among the various covid 19 infection patients I hope uh, uh, this brief lecture uh, thrown some light on the basic principles of various uh, tests that are being used to, for the diagnosis of COVID-19. So I thank everyone. Thank you very much.